This Kainoa, I, I have to honestly say that I have never learned the words because I believe that your recording is classic. No one else should have to ever record it again. And yet at the same time, we do want the song to live. Yes. And that's why this is such a great night because we get to do it just one more time and I get to play for you. Yes, that's my honor. When you think of walking through Waikiki at night, what images come to mind? Maybe traffic congestion? Street vendors? Well, how about live music? Marlene Tsai grew up in the golden age of Hawaiian music, a time when Kalakaua Avenue was full of the songs and voices that beckoned the world to the romance of Hawaii. Marlene entered that magical world at the early age of 18 and never looked back. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Welcome to PBS Hawaii's Long Story Short. There are only a handful of true divas in Hawaiian music, women who wrap their powerful voices with grace, elegance, and beauty. You can add to the list Marlene Tsai. This product of Kaimuki and the Kamehameha schools is quite comfortable in a business setting. But she was destined first to be a singer, an actor, even to inhabit the role of queen. This regal performer started out life with the most undignified of nicknames. One time I was kind of in the fringe of watching what you were doing and, and somebody called you Goofy and I was just offended on your behalf. <laughs> Little did I know that all of your friends and family call you Goofy. Yep, I'm Goofy. Why is that? How, how, how did that get started? Oh gosh, there is a story to that. When I was little, I had very curly, curly hair and as my parents would say, the Hawaiians would always um, comment and would say, oh, and the older folks would say, pupuka, referring to me. And instead of saying, oh, she's cute, oh, she's pretty, oh, she's this, they would say pupuka, pupuka means goofy. Because they didn't want you to get conceited? No, because that's the way Hawaiians say you don't compliment in that fashion. So you go, you say the opposite. You say the opposite. You say the opposite. So as time went on, and of course, it just kind of stuck and the personality became goofy, oftentimes, you know. <laughs> and of course, my father would always say, oh gosh, he's so goofy. Well, it was he who kind of left me with that uh, nickname. But then our entire family, we all have nicknames, you know. I have siblings, I have three brothers, a sister and myself, and I'm right in the middle. What are the nicknames? My oldest brother, Ronald, his name is Jiggy. Jiggy? Jiggy. And he works for Kamehameha Schools. He's a retired fire captain and he's on the gate. So you drive in, you say, hi, Jigs. <laughs> My second brother, Dennis, he's a retired from the telephone company and his nickname is Big Head. Uh-oh. Because when he was born, his head was a little bigger than the rest of his body. But then, as he grew up, they all kind of blended in together. And then of course, then it's me. Then my sister just below me, her name is Yvonne Peewee. Does that mean she was big or she, she was, was small? Tiny. She was tiny. The, the, the story goes that they could fit her in a, in a shoe box and she was so small. Until today, she still is very tiny. And she still works at Kamehameha Schools. And my kid brother, Gary, retired from the telephone company, he loved Hopalong Cassidy. 
So his nickname became Hopalong. <laughs> <laughs> and nowadays, <laughs> the new generation probably wonders, yeah. what is that? Yeah. You know, you lived in Kaimuki, right? Nowadays, we would consider that town, but in those days, it was a bedroom community to... Oh, yeah. I mean, what, what was it like living in Kaimuki in those days? Because uh, now it's such a, I mean, it's a prime real estate because it's so close to town. I don't know if you considered yourself town folks, though, right? No, but I, it, it, you know, it wasn't town, but it was, um, it was a family community. And what I liked about it is because as I was growing up, I loved the ocean. So I paddled a lot. I used to go surfing. Did you catch the bus? No. HRT? <laughs> <laughs> or you walk it, you know, but no, no such thing. And, you know, we're, we had our own little path made our way because Fourth Avenue never went all the way through. So you would just kind of make your way through the bushes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Did all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good memories, though. Off to uh, Kuhio Beach Off to Pier? Kuhio Beach. Well, you know, the wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, I used to swim over there a lot, the wall. I would go to Ala Moana to paddle because I paddled for Huinalu, Huikalia, uh, Hialani, and uh, yeah. And that's a whole other kind of subculture and, 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 and culture of Hawaii, the paddling community. So you're very much involved in your life first in paddling. Yes. And then music. And not one of the others went into showbiz. No, no. None of them did. I was the only uh, individual from the, from the group. And I think because, it, you know how in life, if you're there and things happen and it's meant to be and it just develops in that fashion. And see, we were always surrounded by music as we grew up, always. And, uh, what kind of music? Hawaiian music and, and a variety of them, really, a variety of music. But, I remember our house on Kaimuki, uh, in Kaimuki on 4th Avenue. It was our grandfolks old house and my mom and dad took it over. And I remember every New Year's we would have um, a luau. And we would, mom and dad would uh, clue a pig and I dig the hole and do the whole thing and everyone would you know, make something and would have a, a, a feast. And Uncle Andy and his musicians, that's Uncle Andy Cummings, and musicians, and I remember Uncle Sonny, another aunt, my mother's sister's husband, get on the piano, and, but it was music always. You know, it was continuous. It was your own live music you're oh, talking yes. about? Oh, yes. So we oh. kids were exposed to this all the time. As we grew older, Uncle Andy would be traveling and we develop into our own, our own music and start to, besides hula, you know, we try to sing a song or two. But at some point in time in my growing up years, uh, I remember Uncle Andy and the Cummings family moved to the mainland. But when they moved back for just a spell while they were looking for a place, they stayed with us. And I remember attending Kamehameha schools and Uncle Andy would say, uh, when he'd see me coming home from the school, he said, come, 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 sit down over here. This is before doing homework. This is before doing anything. So I would sit on the steps with him and he'd have this ukulele and he'd be playing a song or whatever instrument, if it was a mandolin or, you know, because he played so many. Was so he known at that songs. time as a composer? Yes, yes. And he was, um, I think this was my sophomore year at Kamehameha or even my first, I can't remember. But in my early years, he was going to the Big Island and he was working with a composer by the name of Jimmy Tucker. And Jimmy Tucker had the song Kainoa, but he didn't know how to write the music, to actually write it in music form. So Uncle Andy was helping him by putting it in meters and, and writing it and structuring it for him. So he was making the strips back and forth. So Uncle wanted me to listen to the song. And I said, okay, and I would come home from school, sit me down and uh, on, this, on our steps outside of the house and he'd play this. He said, now I want you to learn this song. And that's how I started to learn Kainoa, which was the song that started me 
in the business. It's a signature song. It's for one you. of the signature songs. Yeah. How does it go? I'm waiting on a warm and sunny seashore, yearning for the one that I adore. My heart is true. I'm thinking of you forever. I will love you, kind Noah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, Andy Cummings is a heck of an uncle to, to get started yeah. in the music business with. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you something about him. He was, of course, one of the greatest Hapahali composers ever. Um, and he wrote Waikiki, which is another song you are known it's for. Signature, yeah. But I heard that he also tended to write songs about causes. I think he might have been against like the puka statehood. In the pulley. Yeah, no puka <laughs> in the pulley, right? Because he didn't want to see the pulley tunnel yeah, built. Yeah, he did all of that. Do you that. remember all that? Oh yes, I do, and I remember him singing it too. You know, how did, I don't how, know. How did it the, go? I've oh, never heard gosh, it. Gosh, I can't remember it right now. Oh. It was the puka in the pulley. But when we would have these gatherings, you know, his group, which was made up of uh, Gabby Pahinui, Uncle Andy, and Ralph Alapai, and all of these old folks, and they would come to the house and they would jam and they would practice. And you don't know all of this wealth of talent that's right there you with you. You don't realize these and are you have very special people. Exactly. You think everybody's got uncles exactly. like this? Yeah, and it was Uncle Gabby, and it was uncle, 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 all over the place, which is the way we are, right? And then as you grow older, and then you realize all of this talent that's right there with you, and how privileged you've been through your younger years. I don't think Uncle Gabby was at a whole lot of backyard no. luau. I think he was pretty selective. Yeah, but you know, he, he, was the, he was the baby in that group. So he was so kolohe. So <laughs> when he played, you know, he was playing always from the soul and the heart and the seat of his pants. And, um, and he would just go into, you know, one song and the rest of them would just jam. But it was, um, it was a nice experience through those young years. You know, when um, Uncle Andy would call to you on the uh, front porch, mm. um, did he pick any of the other kids or did he sense nope. something in you? No one else, it was just I. And I don't know why, And I, because I would try to sing around the house, and I guess he would, you know, hear, oh, maybe there's a possibility here, you know, with this child. Or nothing in particular for him to um, just pick me out of never the Never said anything no, to you about never did, mm -hmm. never did. But he all he said was uh, he would help me with the phrasing, then if I wasn't hitting the note, he'd make sure that I'd get up to it and would go over it over and over again. What did he tell you about phrasing? Like I'm waiting on a warm, as I'm waiting on a warm and you don't take a breath and say seashore. Mm -hmm. You're waiting on a warm and sunny seashore. Mm -hmm. So we say, you see what I'm saying? You it's see what I'm thought. saying? It's yeah, the complete thought. So I'd say you're waiting on a warm and sunny seashore yearning for the one that I had to say, you don't break up your, your phrases. Okay, okay. So here you are, <laughs> tenth grade, ninth grade. <laughs> okay, uncle. But this would go on sometimes for a couple of hours and uh, then my parents would step in. She has to do her homework and she has chores to do and so things of that sort, but uh, yeah. Did you have a disciplinarian family or very, a structure? Oh, yeah, dad and mom were very, very much d disciplinarians, yes. You know, with five kids, I guess you would have to be, you know. You went through Kamehameha schools, and then what? You know, with all of the music, besides all of the complete education that one gets, but the beautiful music that, that the students do learn, and that's all the choral singing, and uh, that became a learning process to, for me. Yes, but I think you were doing it at a time when Hawaiian language was not in favor at Kamehameha. Exactly, exactly. So you got the music, but not necessarily the Hawaiian lyrics? You would or get the, the lyrics, but you wouldn't, we didn't have, in those days, uh, Hawaiian language was not taught at Kamehameha. This is my 50th reunion this year, so it's been uh, 59, so 2009. So this would be 50 years for me. And back then, they didn't speak Hawaiian. So you would sing Hawaiian songs and not know what they meant? Exactly, 
Exactly. Or you would have to sit down, I would have to sit down with my, my parents or kupuna and ask, you know, what does this mean? And what is this all about? Mm -hmm. Because the language wasn't spoken, because the language wasn't taught, you know. Did your parents think you should learn the Hawaiian language? Probably not in that generation, right? No, because they hardly spoke it at home. Rarely did they speak it at home. It was, you know, it was, it was hush hush. You've seen it come a long way. I've seen it come a very long way. Have you learned to speak Hawaiian since? No, no, and I, and I would love to. You must hear it all around you now. I do, I do, I hear. And you, you know your phrases and you know some things about Hawaiian but that you can relate to, and yes, that I know. But to, to converse, no, I don't, but I would love to. But you, were, you grew up at home and at school in an environment that, was, that uplifted music as a, as a value in life. Well, and at that time, too, while, when I graduated from Kamehameha and during that period of my later years at Kamehameha, as I said, you know, with all of the choral scene, the music that came from there, I thought it was just a natural. Mm -hmm. And so you apply it to oneself. And as you go to parties and you're with friends and you're sitting with an ukulele and you're playing along with someone else and who's, who has an instrument and you're carrying on, it's, you're singing all of these songs knowing basically what they all mean, but not completely and totally. But you're also bringing out what you've learned at the school you know, all that was taught you. Because there's music appreciation, and, and so therefore you're learning all different facets of it. So at this point in Marlene's life, the building blocks of her singing career are falling into place. A family that embraced the concept of kanikapila, the musical craftsmanship of her famed Uncle Andy Cummings, and an appreciation for music nurtured at the Kamehameha schools. Now, Marlene Tsai just needed to be discovered. It was when I came out of Kamehameha and the plan was to go because it was full on business courses that I was taking at Kamehameha because that was my, my intent to go on and further my education in business. And that was the concentration. I was working during that summer uh, in travel. Matter of fact, Uncle Andy had gotten me a job because he was with either Aloha or Hawaiian Airlines. So he got me this job in this travel agency, and I would sell tours and do all of these things and earn some money during the summer. Well, my friends got to have jobs in, in the industry too, and so we would meet every Sunday. A good friend of mine, Vicki Hollinger, and uh, this other gal, Norma, and I would meet at Joe's in Waikiki because we were low on the totem pole. So we had to carry and carry the Sunday, all of the Sunday work and everyone else was home with their family, but we didn't care, we were young. So we pulled the Sunday, the Sunday um, uh, duty. And when we were done, we had planned, we always planned, okay, let's meet at Joe's, let's have lunch and everything and then plan from there on what we're gonna do. This one particular weekend we're, we're uh, at Joe's and in comes, and the Beach Boys would always come over because you were attractive young women? And because we all, I used to paddle, so I knew a lot of them too. So, uh, you know, that was, you know, hi, Jesse, hi, you know, Rabbit, hi, 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 and all of this. So one day they're sitting around and everything and said, hey, uh, you wanna come down to uh, this place? Our friend has a, has a bar, restaurant bar, a club on the other side of the island, Kaneohe. He's, he's um, taking care of it for his mom, and he manages the place. You folks want to go down next week? They have nice music, good music. Okay. So the next Sunday, we plan, and we all meet, and we all get in the car, and we're driving down. So one with the ukulele, another with the guitar, the top is down, and we're singing on our way down to Kaneohe from Waikiki. And we get to the other side of the island, and we get into this park in the back, walk into this honeys. 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 And he's giving us a lowdown on who this guy is. He's a beach boy and oh, they got great music. Sonny Chillingsworth, Gary Ico, all oh, these guys, good, good. So we get there and we're hearing this music. Oh my gosh. 
So this guy comes over and he says, I want you to meet, this is Don Hall. I want you to meet Don, this is Marlene. Hey, this way he can sing. She was singing in the car, you had to call her up to sing. And this is her friend Vicky and this is me. So we sat there for a little bit and we're having our, our um, libations and having a nice time. He calls me up to sing. I said, oh gosh, do you know Kainoa? If I sang it, do you think you could play it? Sing it to us, Sonny. So I hummed a little tune to him. He says, oh, I can get it, sure. So I sang Kainoa. They asked me to sing another song. I sang another song. And it's, then I went and sat down. Before we left, he came up to me and he said, can you write your name and your address and your phone number just you know, so I can get in touch with you? He said, okay. He says, well, what are your plans? I said, well, I'm planning to go to the university and I want to you know, get my degree and oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, maybe you can make some money, you know, extra money. Think you might want to sing here? Sing? Really? Oh my gosh, how much are you going to charge? Uh, you know, how much am I going to get paid? And I'm, I'm asking all of these questions. He says, I'll call you. One week went by, two weeks went by, and I didn't hear from him. And I thought, oh gosh, put it out of my head completely. And I thought, okay, that guy was just all wah. One day I'm driving down Kalakaua and I'm looking in my rear view, view mirror and I see this, this, it looked like a thunderbird and the top was down and I see this car darting in and out and it's approaching me. And this guy's hair is blowing, no shirt on and he's coming up closer to me and I'm getting nervous. So I roll up my window, roll up this window and I going further and he comes and he's telling me to pull over. So I pull around, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, who in the world is this? Because I didn't recognize him. He got out of the car, came over to me and he I had the window up and he's knocking on the, <laughs> the window and he's saying to me, you remember me? I was playing the organ for you, you remember me? And I'm thinking, what church is he talking about? I couldn't remember organ. And then he said, you came to my place with Jesse when he said, Jesse, my place. And I said, oh, Dawn, Johnny and Oh, is that your and window? And I'm looking at so I rolled my window down. And I said, yeah. he said, I lost your number. He says, I don't know where I put the paper. I lost that. He said, I've been trying to get your phone number. So he asked me, he says, can you come down to the, um, to Honey's tonight or tomorrow night? And he says, I'd like to know if uh, we can get some songs together. If you're still interested, I'd like for you to sing and, uh, maybe make some extra money. And that's really how it all started. Singing at Honey's and your boss was Don Ho. And my boss was Don Ho, yeah. But things happened so fast because that night that I got down to, um, I got down to Kane Oye, uh, there were these men that were sitting there, Bill Murata, um, George Chun, um, and I didn't know who they all were, and they were all uh, uh, recording individuals, Herb Ono, and I'm not sure if Jack DeMillo was there too. And they were there to hear Sonny Chillingworth. Because they were gonna make a recording of him? Right, right. Sonny pulled me over, he told me what was happening, and he said, don't worry about it, and just be comfortable, and just we're just going to rehearse. We went to rehearsal, and at the end of that time, Sonny said that a couple of the individuals wanted to talk to me about recording. I mean, it all happened that fast. So I said, what do I do? He said to me, D don't worry. He says, just meet with them and uh, go get a lawyer or somebody that you trust. And, and it just escalated from there. And in a matter of um, a short time, I mean, I was meeting Lucky Luck and Jimmy Walker, if I remember correctly. Who's Jimmy Walker, another he radio was, guy? Yeah, he was a radio guy. And then Jaya Kuhed Pupule. The uh, top paid <laughs> disc jockey in the world, yes. as they said. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, and things really started to escalate and really happened very fast. And here you were, how old, 19? No, 17, going turning 18. I just got out of high school. And it was just that quick. 
Quick indeed. What began as casual conversations with her Uncle Andy had now turned into the opportunity of a lifetime. In part two of our long story short with Marlene Tsai, we'll hear the story of a highly unlikely recording studio that was the setting for one of her iconic songs. And we'll hear advice for anyone aspiring to pursue a career in music. Until then, thank you for spending this time with us. For Long Story Short and PBS Hawaii, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. I enjoy Donald. And you know, his nickname is Quack. Okay, you knew. Donald Ho? Yeah, you knew that. <laughs> Don no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, he was Quack. You were goofy, goofy and yeah. he was Quack. Yeah. yeah. A, a matter of fact, all of the uh, Beach Boys, everybody, all of his close friends called him Quack. Many of the songs that he recorded for all his Beach Boy Day songs, a lot of it, I tell this guy, to, you know, the, the, all of the different songs that he sang. And he would just sing it over and over and over at his shows. I loved them because it reminded me of my paddling days, you know, so it was good fun. Oh, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Not at all. I, <laughs> because these different, as we're talking, all of these different stories are just popping in my head and it's just... Well, just the idea that you call him Donald, and if you don't call him Donald, you call him Quack. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Don Ho we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I miss him. Yeah.